Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you are tuned into Questions for Corbett. And this week's question comes in via email from Stephanie, who writes, If human beings will be genetically modified by coming vaccines, will they be patented soon by Bill Gates, like the crops by Monsanto? Thank you very much for that question, Stephanie. It is actually an extremely insightful question and definitely apropos to the times that we find ourselves living through right now. And there is actually an historical precedent to this idea of patenting lab-made life forms that most people probably don't know about. Even a few decades ago, even legal scholars and the like probably would have found this idea of patenting life forms uh, to be sci-fi fantasy. And even amongst the general public, I'm sure many people still believe that to be so, but it is not so. It is our current legislative reality. Now, in order to understand that, we have to go back through some of the historical precedents that has led led us here. So let's start by examining a uh, 2012 GRTV report that I did called Open Seeds, Biopiracy and the Patenting of Life that I think is worth re-watching if you have not done it so in the recent past, uh, because it does go through this history and how an important 1980 Supreme Court decision on patenting life called Diamond v. Chakrabarty led in precisely no time at all to a gigantic corporate swindle that pertains to the patenting of life itself. The decision, known as Diamond v. Chakrabarty, centered on a genetic engineer working for General Electric who created a bacterium that could break down crude oil, which could be used in the cleanup of oil spills. In his decision, Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren Burger ruled that a live, human-made microorganism is patentable subject matter under 35 U.S.C. 101. With this ruling, the ability to patent living organisms, so long as they had been genetically altered in some novel way, was established in legal precedent. The implications of such a monumental ruling are understandably wide-reaching, touching on all sorts of issues that have the potential to change the world around us. But it didn't take long at all for the decision's effect to make itself felt in one of the most important parts of the biosphere, our food supply. In the years following the Diamond v. Chakrabarty decision, an entire industry rose up around the idea that these new patent protections could foster the economic incentive for major corporations to develop a new class of genetically engineered foods to help increase crop yields and reduce world hunger. The first commercially available genetically modified food, Calgene's Flavor Saver Tomato, was approved for human consumption by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. in 1992 and was on the market in 1994. Since then, adoption of GM foods has proceeded swiftly, especially in the U.S., where the vast majority of soybeans, corn, and cotton have been genetically altered. By 1997, The problems inherent in the patenting of these GM crops had already begun to surface in Saskatchewan, Canada. It was in the sleepy town of Bruno that a canola farmer, Percy Schmeiser, found that a variety of GM canola known as Roundup Ready had infected his fields, mixing with his non-GM crop. Amazingly, Monsanto, the agrochemical company that owned the Roundup Ready patent, sued Schmeiser for infringing their patent. After a years-long legal battle against the multinational that threatened to bankrupt his small farming operation, Schmeiser finally won an out-of-court settlement with Monsanto that saw the company agree to pay for the cleanup costs associated with the contamination of his field. In India, tens of thousands of farmers per year have committed suicide in an epidemic labeled the GM genocide. Sold a story of magic seeds that would produce immense yields, farmers around the country were driven into ruinous debt by a combination of high-priced seeds, high-priced pesticides, and crop failure. Worst of all, the GM seeds had been engineered with so-called terminator technology, meaning that seeds from one harvest could not be replanted the following year. Instead, farmers were forced to buy seeds at the same exorbitant prices from the biotech giants every year, ensuring a debt spiral that was impossible to escape. As a result, hundreds of thousands of farmers have committed suicide in the Indian countryside since the introduction of GM crops in 1997. Yes, it didn't take very long at all before that tiny little wedge of the idea of patenting a genetically engineered bacterium became the gigantic flood of essentially the entire biotechnology industry as we now know it, including, of course, the Monsanto monstrosity and the patenting of crops and uh, all of the 
things that go along with that, the Peruzzi Schmeiser story and other things, things that I have documented in detail in the past. So if you are not up to speed on all of that info, just type Monsanto into the search bar of CorbettReport.com and you'll find a lot of reporting that I've done on that over the years. Or you can follow the hyperlinks from the transcript of that Open Seeds uh, report that we were just watching that clip from. Um, but as you might know, that report was from 2012. It is now 2020, so a lot of things have developed in the intervening years. And so let's cover some of the, those developments. First, we'll turn back to episode 360 of the Corporate Report podcast, Steal This Podcast, Please, which you will remember, I hope, revolved around the subject of intellectual property. And at that time, I was covering a number of different ways that IP uh, pervaded and and permeated itself into our existence, including even to, into our own bodies and our genetic code itself. Yes, as you might recall, we're talking about the idea of patenting human genes, which... Yes, the U.S. Patent Office granted thousands and thousands and thousands of pat patents for human genes to various companies, which it was not a benign thing. Uh, as, as anyone who was working with, for example, BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes associated with breast and ovarian cancer found out, uh, for example, there were a number of laboratories using diagnostics that were meant to help women detect breast cancer. Uh, that were were based on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, and Myriad Genetics Inc. owned was granted the patent to those genes, so they actually sent cease and desist letters to various laboratories that were attempting to use those genes for its their diagnostics. And as you can imagine, there was a bit of an outcry about this, and the ACLU and the Public Patent Foundation stepped up to the bat and filed a lawsuit back in 2009. Uh, looking to get those patents on those human genes invalidated. And the issue itself revolved around U.S. Code Title 35, Section 101, Inventions Patentable, which holds that whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement there thereof, may obtain a patent therefore, subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. And as I did mention in episode 360, Again, I would invite you to go back for more detail, but uh, I did mention that, yes, Myriad's uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 patents were invalidated, along with many, many other patents at that time, thousands of others. Uh, as ne National Geographic explained at the time, naturally occurring genes are no longer patentable. I think the major takeaway is that human genes, as they exist in cells, are unpatentable subject matters going forward, said Jacob Shirkow, a fellow at Stanford Law School's Center for Law and the Biosciences. But, and here comes the big but, synthetic DNA is still fair game. The court tried to strike a balance in its ruling by banning some types of gene patents, but not others. While companies can no longer patent genes with the same sequences found in cells, the decision allows edited forms of genes not found in nature, known as complementary DNA, or cDNA, to be patented. cDNA is not useful for diagnostic tests, but it is crucial for producing protein-based drugs, explained Robert Cook Deegan, a professor of genome ethics, law, and policy at Duke University's Institute for Genome Sciences and Policy. Those are the billion-dollar molecule patents, Cook Deegan said. Biotech companies care a great deal about cDNA patents, and it should be reassuring to them that those patents are still fine. Oh, yes, so reassuring. Oh, isn't it great? Well, uh, I will invite you to go to the actual court decision itself to read about this particular part of their decision where the court ruled that a naturally occurring DNA segment is a product of nature and not patent eligible merely because it has been isolated. But cDNA is patent eligible because it is not naturally occurring. cDNA is not a product of nature, so it is patent eligible under Section 101. cDNA does not present the same obstacles to patentability as naturally occurring isolated DNA segments. Its creation results in an exons-only molecule, which is not naturally occurring. Its order of the exons may be dictated by nature, but the lab technician unquestionably creates something new when introns are removed from a DNA sequence to make cDNA. Now there's a lot of microbiology gobbledygook in there that may be gobbledygook to, to many people out there. I would invite you to look into that. I mean, it's a fascinating process, but at any rate, the long and short of it is this synthetic DNA, complementary DNA, cDNA, is is synthetic. It is created, and thus it is patentable. And so how does that 
impact our daily lives at this point? Well, I mean, there are various uses for cDNA, including, of course, we could look at one example. There are many that we could look at, but this one example is a European patent, uh, EP1375512B1, filed in 2002, granted in 2009, infectious cDNA of an improved vaccine strain of measles virus, use for immunogenic compositions. Uh, so, yes, uh, immunizations and other things can rely on cDNA. Uh, uh, so, ultimately, it, it presents an interesting and, and uh, one could argue from the completely business side of things, well, it certainly makes sense. Well, the businesses, these vaccine manufacturers and others, they, they spend a lot of time developing the processes and techniques and, of course, refining the specific uh, things that they want to introduce to your body to activate the immune system. So they need to protect that information in some way that will allow them to get paid for it properly. They need these types of patents. Well, it does present some interesting questions, especially when we start moving into the realm of DNA and mRNA vaccines. These vaccine technologies that seek to inject DNA or RNA strands directly into our cells to hijack our cells' own uh, protein production process, essentially, to create certain proteins that can then be used as the antigens in an immuno, uh, immunological response, uh, i.e. like a vaccination, but instead of giving you some sort of attenuated virus or something along those lines, no, they're going to inject you with, they're going to inject DNA and RNA material directly into your cells, and the cells will start producing the proteins, which will then be uh, picked up by your immune system which will cause the immune reaction, which will develop your immune response to various viruses like, oh, say, SARS-CoV-2. Yes, of course. Yes, we know this is coming. And uh, there are many different aspects of this that we will have to cover in much greater detail as things continue to progress. But one, one part of this story is the patent story. And that story you can pick up from places like Axios, which had an article, the NIH claims joint ownership of Moderna's coronavirus vaccine, where they note that NIH and Moderna have researched coronaviruses like MERS for several years and signed a contract this past December that stated mRNA coronavirus vaccine candidates are developed and jointly owned by the two parties. The contract was not specific to the novel coronavirus, and it was signed before the new virus had been sequenced. So basically they're saying, well, anything you develop is going to be partly owned by us. And in fact, there was a further statement that they issued to Axios on this entire process where they said that NIAID scientists created stabilized coronavirus spike proteins for the development of vaccines against coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Recognizing the importance of these novel immunogens, NIAID has sought patents to preserve the government's right to these inventions and to provide incentive for commercial partners to invest the capital and resources needed to advance their development, commercialization, and public use as vaccines. Long story short, they are selling non-exclusive licenses to companies like Moderna and others who want to license these stabilized coronavirus spike proteins or whatever else the NIAID scientists claim patent over uh, to develop their vaccines and what have you, or therapeutics of various sorts, one would imagine. So it's already coming. There is already patents issues surrounding these new vaccines, uh, but this goes... This starts to go to the heart of genetic modification and what that term even means. So when you start to look at DNA and RNA vaccines and how they function and what they are actually doing, hijacking your own cell's natural uh, protein production process in order to create these proteins that are going to be the uh, immunogens that are going to be part of this immune reaction that the vaccine is developing... Well, what does that mean then? To hijack your cell, to start producing something, to start producing a protein which itself is patented and is held by the government and also the non-exclusive licenses are licensed to these big pharma players? What does that mean? Your body is producing something which is patented by a corporation. Now, it sounds, it sounds ridiculous to most people, and it should because it is ridiculous, the idea that well, I mean, just because you have some sort of patented thing that's being produced in your body as part of the reaction to this vaccine that you're going to be mandated with and blah, blah, blah. 
well, does that mean that the company or the government owns, has some sort of property stake in your body? Because that's intellectual property that your cells are producing. It's Again, that sounds ridiculous, but it would have sounded equally ridiculous a few decades ago to, to say, well, you know, in the future, they're going to start to genetically modify crops. And if one of the seeds from one of those genetically modified crops blows onto your farm and starts growing in your field, then that company who owns the patent to, to that seed is going to be able to come and find the offending uh, crops growing in your farm and then charge you with having illegally grown their proprietary intellectual property on your farm without their permission. And again, that would have sounded ridiculous. But then we have stories like Percy Schmeiser. It can hardly be even comprehended, but it can be enacted in law. And just in case you needed any further elaboration on that, uh, it should be noted that uh, a couple of U.S. senators have already started to try to overturn that 2013 ruling that um, that allowed the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court to strike down all of those human gene patents. Or I'm sure that that's not exactly the way they're framing it, but there are a couple of senators that have introduced legislation that is looking to rejigger the patent laws. Uh, that would allow for that. And as uh, various commentators have uh, have elaborated, this will directly affect, for example, things like COVID-19 testing and other things. Can, the, can companies get into a position where they can patent certain key parts of the, uh, of the genome or of other of, of, of viruses uh, genome that can then be used as a monopoly club to wield over anyone who wants to develop, say, a COVID-19 diagnostic for whatever those things are worth. But uh, it is coming. And so I will throw in a couple of links regarding that in the show notes, as well as just more information on all the things we've talked about today. But I'll just leave it on this. Well, okay, so yes, okay, so your body might be hijacked, your cells might be hijacked to start producing certain proteins as part of an immune response as a vaccine, but is that a genetically modified human? And I suppose it depends who you ask. If you ask the Reuters fact checkers, the answer is no, but I would not trust the Reuters fact checkers to do your thinking for you. Uh, but even if you were to conclude that that's not exactly the same thing and the legal, the legal ramifications of this won't be so broad, well, Okay, then let's talk about genetically modified humans themselves, because, by the way, in case you missed it, you might have blinked and missed it, but we did cover it on Neural Next Week last year, uh, you might remember that really amazing story about the Chinese scientists that came out and said, yeah, we've gene edited a couple babies, yeah, uh, you know, it, it went well, they're, they're doing fine. Wait, what? Uh, when did this happen? Who? What? And before you know it, he's thrown in jail and never heard from again, and the story kind of goes under the rug. But yes, yes, there are at least, according to the scientist, and no details given and no follow-up, and we'll never know, but there are apparently gene-edited babies walking around out there. And at some point, will there be gene-edited humans that companies may have property right stakes in? I don't know if a company would ever come along and say they own this human being because it has their proper proprietary genetic modifications or what have you, but maybe that is further down the road. But at any rate, I could certainly imagine where you ha they have a, some sort of stake in the proprietary information in your body. What does that mean? Again, this is somewhat necessarily theoretical. I can't answer this because I can't point to U.S. Code Section 73, Paragraph 14b, because it doesn't exist yet. Obviously, these types of things will come before the courts at some point, and there will be case law that is set and that starts to become the law of the land. Uh, but we haven't seen it yet. And these are things that, again, just a few months ago even would have seen seemed radical and amazing and incredible and, and pie in the sky, but uh, go and try to explain the year 2020 to December 2019 you and see how far you would get before December 2000, 2019 you starts to call you crazy. That'll never happen. Well, it's already happened, and one can only imagine what's going to play out in the course of this decade. Gene-edited babies and gene drives and genetically altered humans of various sorts and how is that going to play out in terms of intellectual property? Perhaps that's not the key question, but it is a very important question. Because if this revolves around the idea of ownership, then what does it mean for companies to start claiming, as they have, claiming ownership of various things like human genes? 
These are extremely important points. So I will invite you specifically to go and and re, uh, re-watch or re-listen to episode 360 of the podcast, where we talked in great detail about some of these issues and what they really mean for the future of humanity. And as I say, there are many, 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 many links that will be in the show notes here for you to start to explore these issues in greater depth. I wish I had a definitive answer for this question. Of course, there is no definitive answer yet, but I think it is coming, and I'm glad that this question has been put on the table so that at least we can start broaching the conversation, which does need to happen. On that note, I think we're going to leave it here for today. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.